to Room 101. The show where three guests compete to have their biggest bugbears banished forever to the notorious vault. Joining me tonight are former England cricketer Phil Tufnell, writer and broadcaster Victoria Corrin, and national treasure Sir Terry Wogan. <laughs> OK, can we have our first category? <laughs> oh, it's sport. OK, so what winds up Terry about sport? That one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a finely worked piece here, and it does sum up what I feel about sport. It was exacerbated by the London Olympics. Mm -hmm. Some poor fella or girl would come out of a swimming pool or off an athletics track drained of all emotion four to six years of training gone for nothing because they've come fourth or last <laughs> speechless with disappointment and exhaustion and a fellow like him sticks a microphone under their nose and says how are you feeling <laughs> an example of the kind of thing you mean, uh, Terry. This is, this is a Purchase and Hunter, the, the, the rowers, who've, uh, who've just got a silver medal. What are your thoughts now? We gave everything. We tried everything. We wanted to win so badly. We're just... Sorry to everybody we've let down. you let nobody down. It's heartbreaking. I sort of find it reassuring that at least they're out of breath. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you watch the England football team and you imagine at the end of a game they could sit down pitch side and eat a full roast dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I, I imagine you uh, didn't work up much of a sweat, did you, on the cricket Well, pitch? no, not really. I was, uh, as you say, I was, I was never out of breath, really. <laughs> I was a little spin bowler and then just sat in the dressing room drinking tea and smoking fags <laughs> while we were batting. So, no, never there you go. Any, any young the... people watching? <laughs> <laughs> but Harold Lahr with the, uh, the England fast bowler, when they brought out the drinks interval, he used to have a pint of bitter brought yes. out to him. Well, so did some of the boys when I toured. Uh, my first test match, we were out there, Lammy beat both of them and all the boys, Gower, drinks break, all come out and I'm standing there and I go, have a little drop of that tough as that'll make you feel better. Gin and tonic. <laughs> You'll like this, because I, I like the post-match interview, but sometimes, as you say, if they've lost, it's very difficult them, for them, especially if they're quite close to the people who've won. I have to say, they're great footballers, but they're lousy at the conga. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that was great about the Olympics, apart from the sport, which was an unfortunate byproduct, oh. wasn't it nice that, for all youngsters watching, there was this sense of a new sort of hero? They'd been watching these sort of awful kind of reality stars and people that just want pop music for years, and here was a, a type of person with goals and ambitions that were more inspiring, for which you need to get some personality, you need to hear some of the emotion to find out. If you just saw them doing the sport, you wouldn't get the same lesson in it. That was very good. You sound like my sports psychologist. That was, that was fantastic. Do you have a sports psychologist? Well, no, I didn't go. I didn't no, go. I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've been a big Roger, but I just found it a little bit uh, disheartening that mm. people come off not having done so well and they get a microphone shot. Perhaps if they were allowed to rest for a little bit, put their thoughts together, rather in the same way that Sir Alex Ferguson is, is always interviewed, considerable time after the game. But he's still horrible. <laughs> but he's not out of breath. <laughs> 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 well, I can tell this is coming from a good place, so that's fair enough. <laughs> OK, what is Phil's sports gripe? I know, careful. There he comes. Yes, the Australian cricket team from 1990 to 
does, just... that, does that sort of coincide with your own career? It does, funny I enough. Thought it might. <laughs> they made my life a misery mm. for, for, for 12 years. I think five Ashes series I participated in. One none, won the odd test match, but uh, we never won a series. And, uh, you know, that, that side that we came up against, <clears> I think statistically, was the, was the, best, the best side that's ever played the game. Mm. And I managed to cop it. The only thing you ever won in Australia was I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of It here. was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they knew it as well. That's what really annoyed me about them. You know, the two it was hard not to notice I know, for them, and they it? used to sledge you, you know, and they used to give you a stick. I mean, one of the best sledges, I think, was off Ian Healy said to me, he said, just as Shane Warne was coming up to bowl, he said, Oi, Tuffers, can you lend me a brain? I'm building an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> your, your batting average against Australia, do you know what that is? Um, three. <laughs> it's not quite that high. Well, a little bit more. <laughs> not that high. It's 2.72. <laughs> <laughs> but the people who don't know about cricket, um, Phil's fielding was, was quite legendary. And just to give you an insight into what oh, Phil's yeah. fielding was like, we have a clip of him on the, the one show, which sort of is a, an echo of it. This, in 1990, would have cost you 780 quid. Just right? one, one bottle. One bottle that of that. 90, and yeah. now, if you uh, wanted to flog that now, 23,000. <laughs> so, it's just amazing. And that's what you could do with that much I know, money. I know. Would you, it's would it's you got like that? currency. Would you drink that? Yeah. I'd drink it, but I wouldn't buy it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's because... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yes! What a beauty! <laughs> but it was a scam, wasn't it? Was it was a scam. Now, that was very expertly done, but a very fine gag. Mm. I, I watched that at home and completely thought you'd knocked her. <laughs> Maybe because I could remember this incident. Oh, my life. Oh, there's a mix up. There's a... <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious me. You would not believe that that was possible. <laughs> he got so excited. Sorry, Phil. Oh. That's the first time I've actually wanted to cry on a cricket field. As an Australian bloke once said to me, you were about as popular as a ginger haired stepson. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's have a look at Victoria's sports hate. I don't like people who are naked in public changing rooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not comfortable with nudity when it's me alone in the bath. I certainly... <laughs> want to be trying to put my clothes back on in the gym, you know, appropriately, under a towel, sliding things on, and someone just strolls past, and it's usually somebody, you know, perfect. They go to the gym all the time, all, you know, perky and completely hairless. Look at me, I'm perfect. Why don't you just kill yourself now? <laughs> don't they have cubicles? In ladies? Is it open plan in a ladies' yeah, chamber? Generally, you know, there's lockers where your stuff is. But it's all out in the open, is it? Yeah, but you oh, don't have that. to, you know, people... <laughs> I like the way when Phil said all in the up, he did a bit of a swagger. Well, no, no. <laughs> it's even worse in, in, a, in a, a bloke's gym, I, I imagine. What do you no. mean you imagine? You don't well, know. Uh, no, I've been in a bloke's gym. <laughs> but it's hard to compare, obviously. But um, with men, how, how can I put this delicately at this hour, but um, with men, size is very much... You know, with women, I, I don't know where, if women have made up their mind about whether big breasts or small breasts are superior in any way. With men... The votes have all been counted. <laughs> I say it about ladies' changing rooms, cos that's where I am more yes. often than in the men's. <laughs> you should get around more. I'm not being... <laughs> men, are, men are exactly the same. We all feel completely inadequate. Mm. And then somebody walks in, a bit like yourself... <laughs> yes, I all... think I represent the small handful. <laughs> And um, a way around it, and um, I would recommend this. Now, this is this is a commercially available item. I have, we haven't had this made for the show or anything, but you can take one of these into uh, into a dressing room, 
And uh, <laughs> obviously by now you're getting a few stairs, but <laughs> so you, you just set this up and then zip it down. Yeah. You go in with your, um, you know, your gear on. Yeah. And um, you, you have all the privacy you need. But that's a, that's a genuine item that people uh, that Good. people. Someone use. else is going to jump out there. Yeah, that would have been better, wouldn't it? <laughs> if, if a girl had come out in a sequin leotard. <laughs> we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> okay, we come to the end of that round. Uh, you've all argued your cases very well, I must say. I myself suffer in uh, dressing rooms through insecurity and horror and envy. But I sort of think it, it's, it's my problem rather than their problem. And I, I know it's very tough for those losers being interviewed, but I do like the, the, the drama of it. And also, I hate the Australian cricket team, so I'm going to put them into Room 101. <laughs> Food and drink. So, what winds Phil up about food oh. and drink? Ah! Hors d'oeuvres. Would you like an hors d'oeuvre, Terry? I'd love one, but I've been warned against them. Yes, precisely. I couldn't agree more. No, hors d'oeuvres. Can't stop. I don't think I've ever actually enjoyed eating any single hors d'oeuvre in my life, to really? be fair. Uh, you're at a posh do, aren't you, with your with your DJ on and you're sitting there having a drink and there's this little chap with sort of a roof tile full of all these little sort of stuff coming round. And he goes, would you like an hors d'oeuvre? And you sort of go, no. And they keep coming back, you know, would you like an hors d'oeuvre? No, can you leave me alone? I'm having a chat. So eventually you go, well, OK, well, what are they? And the bloke goes, don't know, but I wouldn't have one. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they look disgusting and so you eventually go, oh, go on, well, I'll try one. And it's disgusting. <laughs> And you spend the next five minutes all going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and trying to find somewhere to spit it out. I can't stand it. All you're doing is reinforcing your image as an unsophisticated lout. Well, no, I, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I mean, what is wrong with a twiglet? That's a very good discussion point. <laughs> it's small food. No point of it. Well, there's ways around this. I mean, for a start, if I, I wear the, uh, the plate ring. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I can be chatting to someone and in an animated fashion and someone saying, I say, oh, there you go. And um, I even... Uh, I, I'd go so far as a finger fork. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so th these are all a way around it. Well, I don't like being bloating meals anymore. I like little delicate... You get to taste all sorts of different things and... I like them to start and then I like the big bloating meal afterwards. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, you've got the, the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> OK, then, what doesn't Victoria like about food and drink? Yes, I don't like the phrase English breakfast tea. It's that... it's just tea. <laughs> Something's happened the last few years, I think since the encroachment of these giant coffee places, mm. trying to make you drink sort of huge American children's drinks, and trying to... <laughs> and they're trying to trick us into thinking that tea isn't a thing. They make it sound niche, they make it sound small, they make it sound like you're a bit pernickety for wanting it. No, cup of tea. Call it by its simple name. But you could easily end up with it. A cup of lobsang souchong. But then you're entitled to throw it in the face of the person that brought it for you <laughs> and say, I want normal tea. I, I don't know if you're legally entitled <laughs> to do that. But it's, I think, for example, it's very rude not to have in your house the ingredients of a normal cup of tea. You have to have those things in your house. It's rude not to. But people think it's OK to offer tea when they just mean they've got some strange thing that they can make into a hot health drink. Don't want it. Just tea. 
This, this feels to me a bit like a sort of, a sort of new, new age colonialism, because you're saying that all of the Lapsang Souchongs and the Salons and the Darjeelings are some sort of quirky splinter group. <laughs> you're a tea fascist. <laughs> That's what you are. This is, this is what you should be drinking out of. <laughs> I mean, that is brilliant. But it's not a new colonialism. It's a fight against the colonialism by the Americans. Everybody knows what I mean by those coffee chains. Oh, yeah. That come here, they take over the high streets, they drive all the little independent places out of business. Turns out they don't really pay any tax. We're getting nothing in return. In return for being tricked into having giant drinks that make us fat and rot our teeth and turn us gradually into Americans. We're not even getting a penny in tax money. And the fight back, it's true, it's not just about drinking tea, it's also about remembering who we are and being proud of it. Not in a fascist way, in a little local, quiet, polite, knitting, how are you over the garden fence, tea kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever use uh, an infuser? No. No? I put a tea bag in a cup and I pour boiling water exactly. on it. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is called uh, the tea tannic. <laughs> <laughs> and look, it hangs on the side so it's in sinking <laughs> mode. <laughs> I would like to just check here that you used a glass cup so that everyone could see the tea tannic there, not because you think it's acceptable to have a glass cup. Well, you, you are very strict, Victoria. I must say. My mum always used to say that her dream was to have a teapot that was see-through so she could watch all the, the mechanics of the tea brewing. We were simple people, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> she also used to say, don't put hot tea bags in the bin or you'll set it on fire. <laughs> What doesn't Terry like about food and drink? <laughs> Just that one. There won't be anything. There won't be anything. Oh. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say I don't like crisps. It's packaging. Not just packaging food. You know, tin of sardines, or your favourites, the pilchard. Oh, yes. <laughs> you put the finger in the, in, the, in the ring thing, dislocate your finger, break your toenail, damn thing comes away, and you've got to get a tin opener anyway. <laughs> it's all for a sardine. Mm. But if you take it even further, I mean, when you get to my distinguished age, <laughs> it becomes very difficult to open things. <laughs> but has anybody tried to break into a toothbrush lately? <laughs> in the bathroom, you think, ah. I will restore my dentures to their pristine glory. <laughs> and a new toothbrush here. <laughs> Apparently, Terry, I'm told that the way to get into uh, oh, a toothbrush what? is with a tin opener. <laughs> that a tin opener runs down the natural groove right on the side and then it comes out quite neatly. So, um... You I've turned got... out to be a bit of a smart aleck, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I haven't tied it yet. I've got a tin opener. Oh. Pretty sophisticated. If I can get the packet in. I have scissors. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyway, apparently that works. <laughs> you know those kind of bottles that you think, oh, I'll just screw the top off it. But you can't. You've got to press it down before you turn it round. And it still doesn't come off. Right. There you are, without your vinegar for your chips. <laughs> and it goes on forever. It's difficult. It's made me realise why old people get up so early, cos they need about... <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, t I like them to be a bit difficult, cos is there any greater joy than when your, your girlfriend passes you a bottle or a jar and says, can you open this, and you go... And inside, obviously, you're really straight and you, you just pass it back casually like that. But really, your spirit is going, yes! <laughs> I tend to hand the thing to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we come to the end of that round. My goodness me, it's a good one, I tell you. I like hors d'oeuvres, oh. and your argument is that you don't handle them very well. But to, um, to remove them for everyone, I, I don't think that seems fair. The trouble is, you just can't hold on to anything for as simple as that. <laughs> can I, can I 
I'm on my fourth wife. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not wrong. That's uh... <laughs> and, and and Victoria, I know what you mean, but I do think we have to accept there are many teas, and they're not all weirdo teas. They are proper tea leaves, and we need to distinguish them. But I have to admit that as I get older, life is becoming a war against packaging on food and, and so many things. So I am going to put food packaging into Room 101. Oh, well, I'll try. Category. Ah, language. Fabulous. So, what winds up Victoria about language? Mm -hmm. Well, I decided to go with the verb to party. <laughs> As in, do you want to party? Do you like to party? I'm going to go and party. <laughs> I partied last night. As if the person speaking is so dedicated to the pursuit of fun, they don't even have time to use a verb and a noun in the same sentence. <laughs> Can I just say, verb, a doing word? <laughs> okay. Okay. If a little bit shy of going to a party mm. and nervous of meeting new people, Mm. The type of person who's going to party, rather than go to a party, just feels terrifyingly upbeat. Mm. You just picture the conga, bowls of drugs and car keys in a bowl. I mean, it, it, it's just... <laughs> you need to get out more, love. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Careful, you could be wife number five. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. There is something about someone saying, let's party, which doesn't say... I mean, no-one's ever said, let's dinner party. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it does suggest the degree of, of, of wildness. I, I... You, you take this young fellow here. He's an Australian teenager who had a party so raucous that he actually got interviewed on the news. Things got so out of hand. Thanks for joining us. The only question that I can think to ask is, what were you thinking? Um, I wasn't really. Why don't you take this opportunity now to apologise to your parents and to your neighbours who have said today that they were frightened? I will say sorry now for everything that happened. Why don't you take and... your glasses off so we can see you? And then apologise mm -hmm. to your neighbours for frightening nah. them. Nah, I'll leave these on. Nah, I like them. What would you say to other kids who were thinking of partying when their parents are out of town? Get me to do it for you. Well, we've got to go, but I suggest you go away and uh, take a good, long, hard look at yourself. I have. Everyone has. They love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Is she sort of telling him off on television, yeah. isn't she? I have what? to say, I'm totally with He's... the teenager on that yeah. one. <laughs> It's use that you're trying to put into room one. No, but it's not. It's, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. And I won't have that said about youth because a vast proportion of the nation's youth, I am delighted to say, are still spending their weekends maybe doing brass rubbings of old coins, <laughs> reading books about the Anglo-Saxons. But they are. There are still young people that have metal detectors and like going to libraries. Do you think they say, hey, let's library? <laughs> <laughs> OK, what doesn't Terry like about language? Well, you don't need to be an expert to know. It's language on TV. For instance, it's a big ask. <laughs> <laughs> Why not just say it's going to be very difficult for him to score a goal under these circumstances? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, you nailed it. What? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I thought you did splendidly there, young man. <laughs> and then there's a journey. We've all been Everybody's on one. Everybody's been in a reality show. I've been on a journey. Look, we all go on a journey. <laughs> <laughs> it only has one finish, our journey. <laughs> what is genuinely frightening, actually, about, about shows like that? is that you're talking about, about cliches, just you don't want to hear these cliches. 
But those shows have been running long enough that on them you now see a generation of people who learned how to speak from those exactly. shows. Mm. Television can have a very pernicious effect. I mean, look at this program. <laughs> <laughs> Undermining the moral fibre of the country. Well... Come on now. I think, don't I represent positivity? Not so far this evening. OK. <laughs> I think that you're the first person I ever heard use the word ginormous, which is a terrible word. So what about your pernicious it's influence? It's an evocative word. No, it has no, 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 no need no, for no, it. No, no, We've no. got gigantic. and We've gigantic. Got yeah, why need to put them together? It's like Jedwood. <laughs> Ginormous is one of my pet hate words. Yeah, he's eaten alive with jealousy because he didn't think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a little sort of flavour of um, new, new language, we have a clip, uh, it's a sort of a compilation from uh, Made in Chelsea. Just listen out for the uh, new and wondrous words in this. I thought, OMG, this is never going to work. It was obvious a success. Everything you do is just successful, yeah. you know, it's She's in love with you, like, too. Yeah, no, please, no, no, no. please. No, no, no. <laughs> That's genuinely nearly reduced me to tears. <laughs> it was very moving. I've never seen that programme. Oh. They're awful. <laughs> <laughs> what is Phil's language gripe? Right. Well, this is... this is... Oh! <laughs> They've got it! Oh, They've got it! People who raise their sort of last couple of words of the sentence <laughs> when you're talking to them, just sort of, like, gets on my nerves, cos you don't quite know whether... You know, you're having a conversation with them and you're not quite sure whether you've got to then speak or have they asked you a question or was it a fact? You know, or something like that. And also, I think people who do that, just raise it at the end of the sentence, I think, sort of, are almost trying to sort of coax you into agreeing with them. Mm. Can't stand it. But they're Australians. <laughs> <laughs> that might have something to do with it. There is a little sort of thing that comes across here, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. It's your anti-Australian yeah. bias. That's yeah. right, it is a little bit. Like, hello, tough, it's a lovely day for cricket. Yeah. You know, oh, <laughs> shut up, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, everything's just a little bit... Too over enthusiastic. You see, I like it because it's like oh. the sentence ends oh, on a sort of a high, doesn't it? it? It can make bad stuff sound good, you know. I don't love you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of, oh, oh that's okay. all right. That's great. Don't worry about it. I like that. It's like Richard Wagner's operas. Rather than completing a movement, they often, they often leave you slightly hanging there. Yeah. If you went it to finish and it doesn't quite finish. It's good to have suspense in life. Life isn't about easy endings. It's, it's, it's clever than that. It's more complicated. Yeah. Frank, I'll say this for you. You are a man with a really unusual frame of reference. Thank you. <laughs> right. I... I, I like variety in, uh -huh. in language of all time, and I do think there's something slightly... It's, it's a bit like oh. dancing girls coming up at the end of a show, that... Da -da -da -da. Yeah. And um, I, I, I am very close to putting Terry in, because I know it is annoying, that stuff, but I don't think it's all... It's not all TV. It's, it's not even all reality. I don't think they ever use the phrase, nail it, on the search to find Jesus Christ superstar. <laughs> But I do... You've, you have won me over to the fact that people who use the word party as a verb have sort of taken over parties and they've made them loud and boisterous. And, and what about the people who actually just want to have a social gathering and share their thoughts and interests? I am going to put the verb to party oh. into Room 101. Well played. <laughs> Category, please. Ah, this is the wild card round, so the gloves are off. No categories to worry about. You can just choose anything at all you don't like. So, what is Victoria's wild card? I don't like windows that don't open, or worse, that open slightly but not properly. 
And people will know this if they travel for work, because it's a particular kind of mm. British hotel mm. that you'd never go and stay in for a holiday, but you're there and they, they've got a window and it opens a little bit like that, but it, not more, and if you ask them to open it some more, they won't do it for your own safety. <laughs> if they're under the impression that everyone who wants to kill themselves would think, I'm so unhappy, I want to end it. Oh, the window doesn't open. I think I'll just devote my life to charitable works instead. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the reason. I've stayed in that hotel, though, those hotels, and after a couple of nights, I fancied throwing myself out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I know the one you mean. You can still get stuff out of one of those, slightly. I mean, luckily for rock stars, this has happened, along with the rise of the flat-screen TV. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I know a, a little tune about windows. <laughs> you ready? I really mean this quite seriously. It seems like a trivial thing that the window doesn't open, but it's part of a huge problem, which is becoming OK to tell people that something restrictive is for their own safety. And the things to worry about being told it's for your own safety are massive queues at airports, ID cards, body scanners at the railway station, police carrying guns. You're told it's for your own safety, but somehow, whenever you hear those words, it's yourself being restricted and somebody else taking control. And when I hear it, I just want to smash my way through the window with a hammer. <laughs> well, there's only one way to follow this extremely serious point, and that is uh, with this picture of a house. This is the exterior of a house that was a church, and it was converted into a house. Now, those windows, you see, they look quite normal, but because of the way they've positioned the floor in the house, the windows on the interior look slightly different. <laughs> in cold weather, they shrink to a small porthole. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's a very fine line, all this, though, this, this thing about, you know, we've got to have our rights and that. Some people are not as bright as you and they need protected from their own foolishness. You think there are people that are so stupid that you have to not allow them to open the window in case they don't know how to stay on the right side of it? <laughs> I, I could argue that I'm, perhaps I've been a bit more broad-minded than you, whereas your mind is, can only open this far. <laughs> <laughs> so... What is Terry's wild card? Research shows. Research shows, I think it's best illustrated by coffee. I have a, a small... Um, this may take some time. <laughs> According to a Greek study, one cup of coffee a day could reduce your blood pressure. British research says it could keep you awake all night which, according to Japanese research, is bad for your heart. <laughs> Two cups a day, says the University of Florida, could keep Alzheimer's at bay, but, according to a French researcher, could be dangerous if you're pregnant. A US study has found that three cups a day can lower the risk of gallstones, while another from Sweden reports that three cups may make a woman's breasts shrink. <laughs> Meanwhile, down in Japan, researchers have found five coffees a day will reduce the risk of liver damage, on the other hand, it may lead to osteoporosis. <laughs> I think a cup of tea is the wisest thing. <laughs> of course, you don't have to worry about any of these foods because you can't get through the packaging. <laughs> exactly, and of course, I have my racing snake figure to think about as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, it is confusing. There used to be things that were good for you and things that were bad for you, and that was it, wasn't it? Do you remember this advert from my, from my youth? Please, Mr. Best, I've seen you on telly. No, I've seen you on telly. You're on Dead Sniffy, weren't you? Yeah. Remember that last match in Spain? Cool. Terrible game. Didn't have an egg for breakfast. Well, there you are. <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't have an egg for breakfast, but I did have two bottles of vodka and a threesome. <laughs> <laughs> but eggs were definitely good for you then, no doubt. Milk was definitely good for you. It was straightforward, but it has changed horribly. I was always told that you can survive just on Guinness. <laughs> it's meant to be very good for you, Tell. You should know about the Guinness. 
Like a drop of Guinness? As soon as I could afford to drink something else. You I did. did. <laughs> 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 OK, what is Phil's wild card? Yes. Tips. To tip or not to tip? That is the question. Mm. Because I don't go to work, or well, when I used to play cricket, or, you know, used to bowl a few, get a few wickets or something, and someone at the end of the day go, listen, you did really well today, Phil, here's a couple of quid, go and have a drink. You know what I mean? <laughs> no one used to tip me. Whereas cricketers in Pakistan, it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was in America the other day and I went into a brasserie. I sat down and I had a cup of coffee and a ham sandwich. The bills come up. It said 10 US dollars. So I got $10 out. I was in there for, you know, five minutes. Put the 10 US dollars down. I walked out of the brasserie. The bloke chased me down the road with his mate, frog marched me virtually back to the place and said, You haven't paid our, our, our tip. Can I say I believe that? Because I've seen Phil play cricket. And the man who worked in a brasserie would catch him easily. Yeah. <laughs> Do you tip when it's already on the bill and...? No. I don't think it should be shared out amongst all the waiters either. If I want to tip a good waiter, I want them to get... I don't want mm. people who are perhaps rubbish getting the same tip as them. It's like when, you know, at the end of a Take That gig and they come out and you, they all get the same applause. It seems wrong. <laughs> Here's an example of a tip. Damien Hirst, uh, you know, the artist, he got out of a cab and he gave the man this as a tip. Signed, says a great drive, as well as the fare, he gave him that and the bloke put it up for auction and it went for 4,500 quid. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. What about that for a tip? That's terrific. Good luck. Yeah. So what I've started doing now is I give, I give them, I'll say that's £7.80. Um, <laughs> a bloke went into a doctor's. <laughs> OK, uh, we come to, to the end of the wild card round. I think that we probably need windows to not open all the way because not everyone is as smart as you are, Victoria, and we have to protect fools. Those health fad things, they are annoying, but I suppose it's because people are, at long last, trying to get fitter and healthier and thinking about what they eat and stuff like that. So, although you were both excellent, I thought, I thought you made a very good point about tipping. It's a horrible story, Phil, about being chased. So I am going to put tipping into room 101. Oh, man. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of the show. Well done, Phil. You were the most persuasive guest, oh. so you were this week's winner. Thank you. So, thanks very much, Victoria Corrin, Phil Tofnot, and Sir Terry Wogan, and thank you, good night. This new series of Room 101 continues on Friday at 8.30, when the guests include Greg Davis. Next tonight, there's a twist in the boardroom in Donald Trump's search for the Celebrity Apprentice USA.